and there we are. Okay. All right, once again, good morning, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to The Artist's Well, where we all gather on Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock for a bit of inspiration for artists by artists. And I'm thrilled this morning to have Anne Kiernan uh, as our guest artist this morning, all the way from Berlin, where she's taken up a residence. I think for the past five or six years, you've been there, Anne. Good morning, Alan. Oh, good, good morning, morning yes. out of Berlin. Can we have your vote, please? <laughs> and these are the votes from the German jury. <laughs> very good. Yes. Hi. You're very How's welcome. Going? Yeah. You're very welcome. Now, interestingly, before before I ask Anne to start talking about her career and so on, um, there's two things I want to mention about Anne. Firstly, very recently she's won the VNA uh, Illustrator of the Year Award, not only in her category but overall which is a fabulous feat and congratulations on that. I know you've, you. you've, you've won num numerous awards, but this is, I think is particularly special, isn't it? Yeah, it's very special. Okay, yeah. and later on when we're looking at samples of your work, um, you're gonna show us the, the actual entry and also even more interestingly, I think, is you're going to show us the, your thought process in coming up <laughs> with the concept, which is super. Yeah. yeah, so I'm not sure if anybody really wants to see inside my head, but yes everybody's welcome good, good, good. <laughs> yeah. um, the other thing i should uh, say about anne is that anne and i go back a few years because anne was responsible for igniting my passion for drawing um for some strange reason even though i've been fascinated with art uh, for many many years uh, from my youth my childhood but uh, i never really got to grips with drawing for some reason um and i I was asked to come along to one of your classes. Yeah. And I said, oh, great, why not? I'd love to do that. So we did some still life work and we were using pencils, these strange things that weren't brushes and oils. Sticks and, and, and charcoal. Any, anything, yeah. 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 And I just found a real, you know, affinity with, with the, that particular medium. And I think to a large degree, it's, it's my love of, of, um, of detail, which of course translates into my work. Yeah. But anyway, enough about me. This is about you. So, <laughs> and maybe you'd start by telling us a little bit about your your art career. You know, when it when it started. Oh goodness! And, and where? Um, yeah, I mean, like, I I'd always drawn. I always loved drawing, coloring. I, I I drew on my copy books. I was always the one in the class that everybody wanted to. Who who was the best drawer in the class? Everybody would point to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was always drawing for me. Um, and um, I, I knew that I wanted to go to, I suppose, art school, but I wasn't quite feeling that I um, wanted to go down that fine art route. Um, perhaps maybe at some point I might still do that. But um, there was a, on Nationwide, on RTE, there was, um, uh, there was a, a small kind of piece about this this college course that had set up in the 90s, in, well, actually it was the late 80s, around 88, 89, um, uh, was a studio that was set up by uh, Don Bluth um, on Cunningham Road, and they were basically hiring anybody who was interested in drawing, and not even, you didn't even need to have a, a degree or qualification drawing, yes. and because of that, um, Valley Firm had set up a um, animation course, and I, I immediately was hooked. I thought, okay, right, cartoons are the thing that I really like. I loved comics. I loved drawing cartoons and characters of people. Um, so I kind of fashioned my portfolio to 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 go there. And you didn't need a leaving cert. <laughs> yes. And while I was kind of completely fascinated by drawing and all the rest of the kind of like academia sort of took a back seat to my drawing even though I, you know I, I wasn't completely poor at school it was just drawing was my thing and I actually got my place in Bally Firm and animation course um, before I sat my leaving cert so that kind of relaxed me a little bit um, and then I did yes five five years and just about got um some work in um in blute studios when they shut down when they exited ireland and a lot of my friends left 
But there were, um, hundreds, with, weren't there? there were hundreds of people employed by them. Hundreds of people, and they were literally given a half a day's notice um, to leave. And um, yeah, and, and then the studio set up over in Arizona, and um, a lot of people went with them there um, to Fox Studios and however. And um, I stayed in Ireland and I worked in a place called Taraglyph. Mm -hmm. which was some people were left over from from Blute Studios um, and that was where I had my first um, animation job and I worked there for a few years um, and then the industry was very kind of shaky at that point in time they closed down for uh, they closed down other studios set up but in the meantime I kind of floated around a little bit and I worked in South Dublin libraries yeah. And can I just ask you, excuse my, my ignorance on this, but when you talk about animation, I always yeah. think about people drawing the same thing a million times, to, but just a tiny bit more. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Is, it was it like that? Was it very repetitive? Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty much like that, yeah. Mm. Um, I did find that animation, I mean, like I do realise that animation is just not for me. It's not for everyone. And it was classical animation that I studied. So yes, it was the 24 frames per second, drawing um, the same image over and over again. And you're kind of playing to somebody else's creative tune and you don't really get much kind of scope to uh, bring in your own sense of creativity. So, it, mm. but actually work or being in animation school was absolutely amazing because they had huge emphasis on live drawing and that is the thing of course when i went to give you drawing classes mm. it's the passion for drawing from life that i absolutely carried with me for the rest of my life i just absolutely adore drawing people i love the looseness of that drawing style um and i did have a couple of um exhibitions in dublin with just some of my life drawings mm. apparently i was quite good so um but it was just because i absolutely loved it i had such a passion for it and yeah. and loved the love people watching so it was kind of it just it fit with me really a natural well. progression yeah Tell me, wh why did you end or how did you end up in berlin how did i end up in berlin hmm. um well, you could say it was a love story but it was also i, I think it needed a change <laughs> Um, I worked for a, um, a documentary film on a documentary film um, with Nasa Nikinon and David Rain was the uh, director or the producer and um, they were looking for a, an archivist but they were also looking for somebody who had an eye for animation illustration because the person they were making the story about had left lots of sketchbooks and um, drawings um, um, behind after he had died. Yeah. Um, but they were looking to make a story about his previous life and they, they wanted to gather um, archive film and footage from around that period. So, I mean, that brought me in a bit to illustration then because um, it was this digging into um, digging into archive and doing research that brought me to um, journalism or illustrated journalism because, um, yeah, I had, it, it became this stepping stone for me. So when I moved to Berlin after I met a film director who came to Gugafa, um, fil documentary film festival that NASA and David run, right. um, he, he came with his film, and then I went to see him in Berlin and we commuted over and back for a few years. And I just loved Berlin so much. As soon as I flew over and actually arrived here, it felt really familiar to me. Yeah. Um, and I had turned 40 and I think it was like, I think I need to make a change here somehow in my, in my life. And that was, that was, yeah. it was a good time to do it. Okay. Um, I couldn't speak the language. And so that made me really focus on, one particular thing and that was illustration because that mean, meant I could work from where I am and work around the world. Um, from, good. From the so before before we get into the, the actual work, um, can you show us your physical space there, where you are and maybe explain the location yeah. of, of, of your, your studio? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel so lucky to have this studio and especially, I know we were supposed to keep this a COVID free zone, but in the past few months, this has been an absolute haven for me because I have been able to come to it every day. 
Yeah. Um, it's a really historic building. Um, my studio space is really nice. Um, it's quite sizable. It's 20 square meters. Mm -hmm. um, I used to share it with somebody, but I, when she decided she didn't want to have a studio anymore, I decided that I would keep the space for myself because we used to work on either side. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a wet desk. Um, so this is where I actually, um, let me see, can you see that there? I can, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so this is where I do my painting. I paint right to the edges, um, which is what leaves the marks. Um, recently, I'd say recently, in the last two years, I started using quite a lot of gouache paint. Um, and I, I find this paint really, really lovely to use. Is that the type um, of powder? Sorry, so I was going to say intrudigo. powder? Louder? No, powder. No, it's not. It's... Okay. Um, it's like a, it's like an emulsion. Yes. Um, it's not powder. No, uh, I, I think I just don't have the patience for that, to be honest. All right. And um, but I just love the colors. Um, I use quite a lot of um, uh, fluorescent colors. Sometimes they're nice for a little bit of accent in the fun paintings that I make. Yeah. Inks I use. The, usually the inks are where my professional work comes in. Um, so I use um, a selection of inks. I love, uh, I love working with them. And the brushes that I generally use for the inks would be this um, the Chinese Sumai ink brushes. Oh. Um, so I can make a kind of like a single stroke and, um, and it, it just gives this beautiful Oh God, it's a beautiful texture and a really yeah. nice clean line on the side. Probably so, the rail there is beautiful as well. Yeah, um, you, you just get one sweep down and it, yeah. it, it makes this lovely mark. So um, that's the Sumai ink brush I use. Um, and I just, I'm obsessed with getting inks. So I just use, I, I'm, I, I have selections of inks um, I, and they all kind of come with their different qualities. Like these ones here are acrylic and they have like this two-tone effect on them. So mm -hmm. when they seep out into the water, um, it, you get this kind of like dark intense color, but you also get this pale uh, secondary color that happens inside in these, yeah. in these inks. The these are acrylic inks. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the wet desk. Um, I have... Uh, reference books that I use um, and this would be my dry desk and because I'm an illustrator and I work um, for like a lot of editorial stuff and um, you're you may be asked to um, to rearrange an image or something like that so yes. for example I would have a certain imagery that would be um, in separate uh, layers on, and I use Photoshop for that also. Mm -hmm. So um, I would um, make, I mean, this is a little one that I made yesterday. I would make separate layers so that if the art director would say to me, okay, I like, I like this section here, but can you move it to the left or the right? I can do that. Um, but otherwise I do make a lot of, um, Paintings just all on the one page. Yes, yes. So it's very warm today. It's like yes, so I believe <laughs> it's thirty-five degrees. And so the windows are open. I um I am in a very historic area of Berlin. This is the former exclusion zone for um, the Stasi, and this here across the street is the Stasi prison, very famous prison in Hohenschönhausen. Um, that's the tower of the prison and the wall itself and inside the interior of the prison was actually built by the prisoners. Um, and right now you kind of have experience of like a living history um, because the tours are usually given or guided by uh, former inmates, um, former yep. prisoners of the Stasi. Um, so it's always really interesting and you don't really do have, I think, it's not going to be very long that you will have that experience of having, mm. um, you know, former prisoners because they're 50s, 60s, well, 60s now, 70s. Um, yeah. It's a very old part of East Berlin, this. And um, 
So we're an unusual, eclectic bunch of people. Well, if, on, that, on that point, Anne, um, yes. th you're not alone there, are you? I mean, this is no, a huge are, building. I mean, this, I'm in a block of um, 250, um, 250 uh, artist ateliers, yes. and um, they're from all over the world, from like Egypt and Australia and Spain and Iran and everywhere in the world you have artists here and um, here in this actual building which is across the road from the prison um, is it's the former um, operational technical sector which I absolutely love because I'm so into kind of like investigations and espionage um, and, and so this was where they invented and designed um, tools and items for spying spying on on the, the civilian population and spying on um i suppose yeah anybody who might be considering overthrowing the socialist structure um and right in the center of this building there is the, the ultimate form of paranoia um so all, this building is it's built with um very east german uh, materials there's iron shards in the walls so you can't drill holes um, it's, it's probably pretty much indestructible, which is why they can't do anything with it except to have artists in here. Um, but right in the center, there is a room, we call it the copper room. Um, and I've had an exhibition in there. We've had some openings, in, open exhibitions in there. And um, it's completely lined in copper and lead. And basically um, it was just where they made sure that all of the, uh, all of the secrets were in there, any radio waves were trapped from getting in there. Um, it was to stop spying happening on their most secret stuff. So yeah, it's Amazing. fascinating. I love it. Absolutely I love it. Fascinating. Here. And 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 yeah. so but is, is it exclusively there for, for artists now? Um this atelier, yeah. I mean, well, I mean like it's all types of artists and mm. Um, I mean, like you, you don't just have painters, you have sound artists, there's graphic artists, there's like musicians here. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a, it's quite a, a creative um, yeah. bunch of people. And, and do you, do you mix a lot with, with, with the other artists? You know, um, is, is there a central we, cafe yeah, or anything we, like that? I, I mean, like the, the walls or the halls are, are very, like, how the building is set up is that it was always going to be very private so the wall the halls are really long yep. um and every room is private all that so you don't have much wandering or uh, um mm. interaction with people in the halls but we do have a couple of exhibitions every year it's not going to happen this year now but or there might be um mm. there's a little cabin just on the corner where people meet for drinks or however yep. um so we have some interaction not lots of interaction mm. and of course i mean illustrators, artists, they're pretty kind of like, you know, they're like hermits anyway, they, they prefer are. to be antisocial. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, there might be some interaction, but not loads. And tell me, are you, are you living far from, from where you are? And how do you I, <laughs> I live um, 6.1 kilometers from my flat. Mm -hmm. And my flat is in, is still is also in East Berlin, it's Prenzlauerberg. I cycle every day and I cycle, um, Oh, on my bike, on my bicycle every day. That's a racer, Anne. That's a racer, uh, not a bicycle. <laughs> on my tricycle. Um, uh, and it, but Berlin is flat, so it's not that difficult to kind of like get around and move around. And of course, it, it is pretty much a bicycle city. Um, we yeah. have extremely wide um, cycle paths, and um, yeah, uh, and the weather. Uh, usually, I mean, apart from. Actually, I've never had the experience of having this minus 20 hard mm. Berlin winter yet. This is, I suppose, climate change that's happening. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, I think we've reached minus 10 at some point, but it hasn't been terrible. So for the most part, I cycle year round. Yeah. Yeah. And tell me, um, you did a BA, I'm oh, sorry, an MA. Yeah. And you did quite an interesting project. Can you tell us about that? Oh, yeah. Um, so I have a, I put a big amount of importance on like learning, learning your craft or putting, finding the knowledge to do whatever you want to do. So um, I, I decided I would go all in on illustration about uh, three years ago and I signed up, I applied for an MA and um, 
for my final year, then I had to create a project to make a final year, you know, like a final thesis. And um, so I, I'm quite fascinated by um, this, this thing that they have in Berlin. <coughs> it's all over Germany and it's all over the world, really. But particularly in Berlin, they, because we're poor, <laughs> um, they, they put stuff out on the street for people to reuse. So everything is reused. Oh, and, yeah. um, and their boxes are left on the street. And uh, the there's a sign written on the box called Zufreschenken. And that means uh, to give away. Um, so there could be anything like, um, you know, you can get your whole kitchen kitted out, fridges, sofas, chairs, uh, crockery, book books, a lot of books. And I just love books and especially, I'm particularly drawn to older books, old yes. books. Um, and of course, because I live in East Berlin, when there are house clearances happening, generally, um, you know, the people will clear out the old books as well. And they just put them out onto the street um, in these boxes. and. I like to save them before the rain might catch them. Um, and I've, I just found that sometimes you will have, um, you'll find just magical little pieces, but because I'm an east, east side of Berlin, you might have, for example, um, you know, you have quite political uh, books like um, The Political Economy of Capitalism and Socialism. Um, we have like um, Political Economy, um, the small political word book. So I'm quite fascinated by these because obviously the people who had these in their houses were interested in the um, in the politics of the time. And um, in these books also, this is an encyclopedia, like what most people would have. Um, inside in the books, um, people would use the books as places to secrete things, like keep things safe or hide, hide documents or however. And so you, you will just find um, letters, um, documents. So here's, here's one with the, um, this is so beautiful because obviously this was very special to somebody. They pressed a flower. Um, so they're, they're places, they're things and places that special, particularly um, newsworthy items are just clipped out in newspapers and put in between the books and then they're forgotten about. Um, this is a letter here from 1955 and it's, there, there was actually a few of these in the book and it's between this woman, Lena, and, um, and her uh, husband, Siegfried, and he moved away. And so they had these series of letters and they were in between books, pages, books. So I, I decided I would make, um, I, I would use these books to help me <clears throat> find my way around Berlin. And um, sorry, I'm moving around now a little bit. You're fine. Um, You're fine. So I, I got a map of Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, and whenever I would find a book, I would mark it, uh, the street where I found it, and I would mark it with a red dot. And then I would try and have that book send me somewhere in Berlin. So if there was an item in the book with an address on it, mm. where the book was printed somewhere in Berlin, which generally they were, if they were the political books, they were generally printed somewhere in some print shop in Berlin. And then I would have the book send me to another place in Berlin. So I just found my way around Berlin by using these books. And then I would draw um, a reaction to an experience or because I love people watching, I would um, make reactionary drawings to those. Mm -hmm. And generally they might be very quick. So they might be just something like this, this, this hipster with his bicep with, on his racer bike with, um, his little dog under his arm. This is how people carry their <laughs> creatures around. Looks like I mean, your I've, seen people, I've seen people with parrots on their shoulders cycling around. Um, you know, this guy here, I saw him um, and he just basically, he was completely dressed in orange. His hair was dyed orange and his eyebrows were dyed fluorescent orange. Um, so yeah, um, dogs, I have quite an obsession with dogs. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would match and pair um, these, um, these uh, documents that I find. Mm -hmm. This is in, and I put them into my, they're on my website. So you can yeah. actually see the pairings. 
Um, so this is the letter to Lena. Um, and actually this was from a, just a woman I saw on the U8. Um, and I made 200 pages in this book that, uh, for um, Sue Frischenken. I called it Sue Frischenken and it, it became my, um, my MA major study. And yes. um, yeah, it, it, it's, I, I did send it to some small publishers here in Berlin. Um, but of course there is massive uh, cost in copyright issues using um, sections of books and things like yes. that. So um, there was some interest, but for the small publishers, it's too small, it's too, it's too expensive for them to clear these um, copyright things. So um, very enjoyable project. It's ongoing. I just continue picking up books and, and, stop. <laughs> and still, yeah, and, and still draw and I, I, I draw every day. So very interesting. I mean, well, I, I know you do. And in fact, in fact, looking at your Instagram, uh, almost on a daily basis, I noticed that you've got more work constantly coming through. Yeah. And what, I, what I was going to ask you is, I get the impression that you you have sort of two sides to you. There, there's a sort of Anne's personal work and Anne's business work. Yeah. And and how do they relate to each other or do they relate to each other? I mean, they're really, I, like I find them quite symbiotic. They they It's very necessary for them to both be happening and sometimes if I'm struggling, for example, if I'm asked to make a piece of editorial, um, I might need to um, sit down and just make some marks and, and scribble something really twisty before mm. I can then transfer. It's like it unlocks something in me. Yes, um, yes, yes. So the, the obscure, twisty, um, contorted pieces um, work, in helping my um, ink work and, yeah. and vice versa as well, because I, I like to make the beautiful inky flowy stuff as well. But I think um, for a while I was only making that and it, it, it became very samey for me. So, um, and I, I have, I do mentor some young um, illustrators online um, and it's, it's one of these particular questions that, I think younger people always ask, especially illustrators in particular anyway, because, uh, and that is, um, you know, I really need to find my style. And I, I, I would never, I would never push anybody to get, get, get fixed on something, mm. get fixed on a style. Um, I mean, I think it's the same I said to you, Alan, you know, it's like, there is no such thing as a wrong drawing. Um, I, I will always, uh, you know, and, and I've never, I've, I used to edit my drawings and throw them out and stuff, but now I, I just don't, I haven't thrown out a drawing uh, and I have stacks of them now in right, probably yeah. about three or four years now. Um, mm -hmm. I've decided that I, I will stop that practice of like tearing up drawings and thinking they're bad because there's always some element in that drawing that I might be able to use somewhere mm -hmm. else down the line. Um, or revisit it and um, and relook at it and um, and that works really well for me. But yeah, the ink stuff and the twisty stuff are very necessary to each other. I find because they're both come from a very emotional place for me. Yeah, um, yeah. it's interesting you say that um, you don't throw things out anymore and that that you don't sort of say, oh, I don't like this, tear it up. I actually yeah. have to get over this block where, yeah. and I still do it to this day all my drawings go through what I call an ugly phase. Yeah. Where you, see, you throw your hands up and you say, this is not working out. This is the one that isn't going to work. Yeah. And you persist. You always get through that. It's, it's, it's like yeah. a pain barrier for runners. Yeah. You know? And you I mean, do have the other side. I had very many uncomfortable moments when I was studying for the MA and I did have a really great um, tutor for that. And we had many long conversations about it. And he just really loved when I felt uncomfortable. And I was like, I would push out of my comfort zone because yeah, I always wanted to make, I, I started when I started illustrating first, I, I thought I'm gonna do food illustration. Mm. Um, I'm just, you know, I like making pretty things. I want to have it right. But it did kind of start to feel very familiar to me in how I felt about animation and that was, I just felt creatively kind of like not pushed yes. at all. Um, so that's then when I started to kind of like reach deeper. And um, 
deeper for me is inside and sometimes that stuff is very uncomfortable coming out i mean like i you can see some really awkward stuff on instagram but i'll, I'll leave that there mm. um and usually if i'm in contact with art directors and they ask me you know they'll ask me to make something for them for a piece and i will kind of point them to either my instagram and my website and i will say pick me out a couple of things that you know appeal to you and how you know what's what would you like and so they might pick a piece from something really obscure um with the ink and mix the two of them together so they they do kind of like they're they very necessary for each other yeah. and it's also really necessary for i think art directors self-initiated work is really really important for practice in, in sorry history. Anne, could you say that again i missed that self-initiated work oh yes is very very important yes uh, for practice for 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 people who want to hire you because this is i mean my illustration is my job sure yeah. um they want to see that you're in practice and mm. what you do outside of your professional work is also just as important and illustration has made me feel like i it's it's my drawing outside of the professional work is just as a, a is 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 so enriching and mm -hmm. When I was in animation, it, it I was so tired recreating the same drawing over and over again. By the time I got to the end of the day, I just didn't want to pick up a pencil. Yeah, yeah. So there yeah, were periods in time where I just stopped drawing for a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, it's an Irish person. The guilt kicks in. I feel like I spent so much time and effort in college. And it was good at some point. People would say, oh, yeah, you were good, Anne. But, um, yeah, so then I would kind of pick it up again for a little bit and then, sure. yeah. Okay, yeah. so look, let, let, at this point, let's look at some of your work. Okay. Um, there's a couple of, of um, slides here that we yeah. both put together. And um, let me just get this thing sorted first. So this takes a bit of time. Oh, goodness, it's so hot. <laughs> Well, the traffic isn't causing a problem in terms of sound, is it? No, good, no. <laughs> okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, full screen, I hope. All right, so, right. Anne, over to you. <laughs> I've done yeah. enough talking, over to you. Okay, um, so this is called From Darkness to Life, and um, this was an open call, actually, and they do, I'm not, God, I, this is the thing, things have changed so much now when, since COVID, but actually, you know, remote working still works. Um, so this is the Riverbank Arts Centre cover for winter spring uh, brochure for, for their, their art centre and their programme. Um, and they make an open call twice a year for artists to submit um, something they've already drawn. Um, you don't actually have to produce something for them in particular for the cover. Um, and they just made an open call. I submitted uh, a piece to them. They said, we really like your style. Can you make something for our spring, summer, or spring, winter, spring? Um, and then it had to be appropriate for winter, spring. Yes. Um, and I, what I usually do is I, um, I would make a few sketches, uh, maybe I would, run at maybe 10, 10 sketches, 10 roughs or whatever. Um, and then I make the selection of what I'm going to offer um, to a art director. So I will give them the option of three, usually an option of three. So that kind of limits their decision making. Um, and mm -hmm. they will select one of the three so that already I'm making a decision for them almost um, of what I will make. And so they picked this deer. He's He's growing out of the, cause, because the Riverbank Art Centre is in Midlands, you know, the bog down there. I, this is what I was going for. Um, things growing out of the bog. And so I went with this dark ground of the bog, um, this growth. And um, yeah. Um, this, Very beautiful. This Very deer beautiful. springing forth. And um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is all kind of like blended ink. It's, uh, it, it is painted in one piece apart from the additional uh, green leaves 
Um, so from the black right up into the green, this is a is one piece, okay. um, and it's a it's a gradient that ha that it's it's a it's a game of patience. You might have to make this image about I don't know four or five times to get the gradient right and correct. Um, but the same thing with the ink, which I really, really love about ink, um, and it's very different from watercolor, which I used to use quite a lot. Um, ink has this really beautiful clear line to the edge. So you, you put the water where you want the ink to end and pool and gather, and then you get these beautiful clean finishes. What kind so of paper are you using? Um, I use a... Um, Uh, it's a cool breast. Um, I mean, this is a, it's in German. Um, it's a 425 um, gram, 200 pound paper. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yep. Um, yep. And it's, a, it's watercolor paper. It's a very heavy watercolor paper because I use quite a lot of water when I'm working with ink. And is it textured um, or is it very smooth? It's textured. Yeah. Which I, I like the texture. I do have smooth papers, but I prefer the texture ones because it's easier for me to control the water on that. Yeah. Um, I paint. So the reason, the reason lines. I asked, Glenn, sorry for yeah. interrupting. The reason I'm asking you is because, you, as you were saying, you get very sharp lines um, yeah. using your ink. And I just thought maybe that's because you, you'd be using a very smooth paper in order to achieve that. Whereas texture yeah, no, would like give you that sharpness. Yeah, no, I, I find that the textured paper, because what I do is I paint, uh, I generally paint blind with the water. So I will put in the brush stroke with the water, with water only first, mm -hmm. and then I drop the ink in. So ah. I can maneuver the ink around in the water. Yes. Um, so the, the textured paper allows me to control that a little bit more okay. because the, it doesn't go flowing away from me. Um, it stops. It stops on the on the tooth of the paper. So yeah, um, yeah. They're super happy with that. That was kind of like a double cover, uh, yes. front and back. So when you open out the whole spread, I think I no, I don't have one with me. Um, yeah, you can open out the whole spread, and I, I, I'm sure they have some still down there, or maybe they don't. And hopefully they're all gone now at this point. But um, yeah, but yeah, if anyone's you. interested in answering their open calls, they have them twice a year. Um, usually September, October, they'll be looking for the winter, uh, with the winter spring selections. So yeah, have well, a look in on those. Yeah. Wait, shall we move on? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is also. Actually, this was the piece that I submitted to the Riverbank to win the, win the commission. And um, so this was for a, a mental health um, charity um, for art therapy. And it's called Cultivating a Healthy Mind. And that is, yeah, this is just ink. Um, yeah, and some and, and lots of layers. So the base layer is yeah, just green ink. At the same thing where I, um, I make uh, water painting and then drop in the ink. And you just have to maneuver the paper and 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 allow the ink kind of flow into the sections that you want it to. Um, do you have done yeah. a preliminary sketch before doing that? Yeah, I do. I mean, like I I generally make. Um, I make, I make a, a pencil sketch, usually it's pencil sketches that I work with, and, yeah. um, and then I would put the pencil sketch underneath, mm -hmm. and I use a light box. Um, do I have here? Um, yeah, I use a light box, and I'm going to put my pencil here. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit messy now, but this is yeah. an LED light box, mm -hmm. very flat. Um, and I put my pencil uh, drawing down on that, and then I put the watercolor paper on top, and I can I can paint in with the water on top of a pencil sketch, yeah. and yeah. and then maneuver it around, and then put, put in all the layers, and yeah. I think that's magnificent. I love it. Yeah, and this one here is really large, so um, I wouldn't I would be using a window or however if I was going to make um, a, a larger piece, but this one here, yeah, was. Is, is really quite quite big. Yeah. I think it's it's in the the picture of me laughing <laughs> um, for my introduction. Oh, um, that's nice. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, 
yeah, that was in our first uh, exhibition here in the in the um, atelier. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Now this is an interesting one. Can you explain <laughs> this up? <laughs> so um, I live in East Berlin, and, <laughs> and um, so there's still a there's still a, a quite a tradition or quite a um, quite a habit for East Berliners to kind of live the way that they used to used to live, and they didn't have many freedoms back in the day. <clears throat> so there's a there's a practice called um, FKK or a Fry Cooper Kultur. Um, and that is free body culture. And um, so we have naked sunbathing here. And, um, and it's not just in like restricted areas. It's you, you, at any park you go to, there would be naked sunbathing on a warm enough day. No. Um, but um, I, I, I was making these small kind of like little collections of um, uh, observations uh, during the Corona, I would call them Corona diaries. Mm -hmm. um, and um, every time there was a restriction lifted, um, I would make a little reaction to it. So um, this was like, I think it was one of the first sunny days, um, late spring, mm -hmm. um, when the first restrictions were lifted after we were allowed out. Um, but um, as you can see, people were very, uh, very, they wore masks um, and very happy to wear masks, but there was definitely so they're, they're, they're technically not in the nude. No, they're like technically that. not in the nude, but it, it's like, yeah, they, they it, waltzing around in, in, well, I mean, like they don't waltz around, but they do. Germans well, they, well, they, they do. Germans and, 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 <laughs> they stand and, uh, up when they're sunbathing. Yes, I know. I sent you a headline yesterday. <laughs> you did send me a headline yesterday, which just proves the point that, uh, that Berliners have this, this uh, compulsion to take their clothes off at the, at the slightest moment. And this is a photograph that appeared in The Guardian yesterday, and it was taken by a non-looker uh, who got the permission of the individual to, to uh, show it um, and on Facebook and so on, but it was taken up by The Guardian as well. And it was uh, this here, a typical <laughs> Berlin scene in the park. But the interesting thing about this is um, these little fellas here, there's a wild boar and two little pigs, or borlets, whichever they're called, and they're running off with your man's uh, laptop, thinking it was a pizza, because there was pizza nearby. <laughs> and of course, yeah. he, he had no problem in chasing like crazy after this, and eventually retrieved his laptop, uh, to the applause of everyone around, your <laughs> man still in, in his birthday suit. Uh, yeah. you know, it was just so funny, I thought. Yeah, you, you can be walking down in the, uh, you know, I went to the lake yesterday, and you know, you'll just have somebody cycle by. Uh, on their bicycle, bicycle with, with no clothes, yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Move, it's moving it. on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this was one of the first ones, like this is my COVID Corona Diaries one, this was one of the first ones. This was actually just before the um, pandemic was announced um, and people were kind of still going out and kind of like the, 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 what the rhetoric was, was just, just don't touch your face. Whatever you do when you go out, just make sure you don't touch your face. Yeah. Um, so somebody touches the face. I mean, this is where I found myself going, "Oh my God, I've touched my face!" And yeah. um, so there's just a, this big kind of game show sign pointing to the woman who touches her face. Um, there was uh, I have the little nod to the toilet paper, the run on toilet paper with the answer marching off with toilet paper. Um, and then just it was an afterthought then um, that I put in the DEM for pandemic in the panic thing. Mm -hmm. um, so this one here actually did win me uh, uh, a commission then from Political Europe, um, uh, which was the, um, it's the one of the people queuing in the Lidl supermarket. That's it there? And yes, this one here. Um, so he, I was posting these on Instagram because I have quite a few art directors follow me, put my pandemic one up and then he, he contacted me and said, we're doing this series um, of artists from all around the world, what, how they are seeing, how, how they are drawing the new normal. That was what it was. And, um, and he, he asked me if I would make this and, uh, or make, it, make my perception of what it was. And Germans are kind of funny. They're very rule. Um, they keep rules and stick to rules. Um, but in supermarkets, uh, 
not having a tight uh, queue, uh, having a space left in the queue is just like, it was so um, against their, uh, against their brain power. They just, yeah. they, they found it very difficult to leave that two meter space. Yes. Um, and also the club culture in Berlin, um, using these kind of like fetish masks and stuff. I liked the sure. idea that um, all masks were fair game. Um, when you were I was wondering about that in pandemic yeah. yes so i mean like there's a lot of fetish clubs here and well, they're all closed now um in in berlin and um i loved the idea of uh using these masks uh for 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 other reasons than now going to the closed clubs um so nobody wanted to touch money nobody's like yeah there's just chaos everywhere and obviously the toilet roll situation um yes yeah. very good very yeah good. Uh, this is quite different. Yes, um, this is kind of like um, this leans towards the political and um, the investigative journalism stuff that I, I work on as well. Um, I feel like this is a really strong image and it's kind of like um, it, it's it's going towards um, yeah I think I, I think it's I'm going to put this into a couple of um, yeah. competitions. Was, was, it commissioned? was this commissioned? Um, this was commissioned and it's about the situation in Egypt. It's the oppression. It was basically, there was, it was, there was a young uh, film director and obviously I'm into documentary filmmaking. A young film director um, died um, on pre-trial pre detention. So a lot of artists, um, when you're living, we, we live in a very free society, but when you're living in a society of oppression and no free speech, um, artists, filmmakers, uh, journalists um, are just disappeared or arrested and taken into um, pre-trial detention. And so this piece was written about um, a, a Shady Habash. He was 22 years old. He died in pre-trial detention and... Um, I have, on the either side of it, you can see that there are uh, people looking away and there are people looking towards him and they've got uh, masks on their mouth. And so uh, this is, people can see what's happening, but they're, they cannot say anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently the guards uh, didn't, he was, they were called. Um, when he was dying inside because the prisoner the prisoners are quite pack, tightly packed um the prison guards didn't come when they were calling for help so they looked away they chose to look away so it's a very deep um uh piece and uh very hard um to do um but it was written by the uh, by the writer by the journalist who wrote the piece for my that for my winning illustration, the Twitter jail piece. Okay. Um, a, which, ironically, yeah, they're both about jail, but one of them is about social media jail, and this one is actually about jail and reality. And okay. um, yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. okay. Um, so, so this was also another piece for Political Europe. Um, and um, it, it was about, it was about breaking down the, the con confusion of British politics during Brexit. Um, and there was, um, there's particular words that are used um, in the House of Parliament in, in Britain that are so historical, they're kind of like not really known. Um, so it was, it was called the lexicon of British politics. And um, it was just a, it was a, it was almost like a dictionary. Um, so I, I basically had to translate some of them in an image and I had to make it look very chaotic. And yeah, so. Yeah. So why, why the pig and the duck? Or should I ask? Um, because, well, there is a, uh, this was about uh, one of the politicians. I'm not sure if you recall that MP who claimed his duck yes. on or moat on yes. the fences. Yes. So there was the ducks. And the pig, I think, is something, it's called something, there's a, there's a word, the swine or something, I can't remember what it is, but anyway, it was like, it, it's, it, it's got some, some meaning, I can't quite remember now. Sure, don't worry, don't worry, that's good, yeah, okay. Yeah, this piece is, um, it was made, and actually this was shortlisted for the um, the World Illustration Awards two years ago. This is 
people mention mention marked uh, is the is is the name of it and um it's for a philosophical magazine a german magazine and um it's people and revolution it was um so i had to make one image and try and compress it down uh, to tell a bigger, wider story. So this was people in revolution and what revolution does and however. So this is obviously, you know, there is a there's a trend in my in my illustrations yeah. where there's quite kind of yeah political. But um, but I'm but hired no. for that, so it's obviously <laughs> yeah. they they like the look of them and yeah yeah. So this made the cover of this uh, political journal. Yeah. Very good. Um. The these are um, pieces that I'm. Alongside my, um, alongside the, the Super Schenken, I'm also, I was also exploring trying to make sound in pictures and try to kind of like visualize sound. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I'm, and this is a larger piece actually. I have another one there that's on, on the thing. And, and these are, I'm, I'm trying to kind of make make them be heard rather than just see them. And there's also another visual trick that works with these. I, um, I discovered these glasses, which is kind of like, it's kind of a quirky trick, but um, I use these 3D glasses um, and they separate the layers of these paintings. So when you look at these paintings, they, 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 they come apart. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so this one here is Sounds of the City. Um, and I'm, I was making a series of these and these were to be in an exhibition actually in the Irish Embassy and it was supposed to be in June um, this year, but um, uh, the Irish Embassy here in Berlin. Um, but of course, yeah, the unsaid happened and the exhibition was cancelled. So yeah. It might happen again. Yes, I think so, and they'll be very happy to have me now because um, they're very thrilled that I, I've won this award as well. So they want to um, they want to celebrate that somehow, and nice. they've been very supportive here in Berlin. The Irish very Embassy good. are great. Very good, very good. Yeah. Okay. Um, the these this is a, a regular client that I work with, and uh, they're an NGO here based in Berlin. And I've been working with them for about a year and a half or so. Um, they're called Tactical Tech. And um, they did a call, an open call on Twitter um, for an illustrator um, for a new, a new um, series, for a new kind of like um, section of work that they're making. And it's called Exposing the Invisible. And it basically is, it's a guide and uh, for people, uh, citizens and journalists um, to expose wrongdoings. Um, so there are many chapters um, and um, if they, they, basi they basically wanted me to make illustrations that were not really paintings or not really illustrating anything that would, the rules were, I couldn't use typical icons of um, investigation data or however, so I couldn't use hands, eyes, magnifying glasses, um, typical data um, and technology icons. So I had to use very, very, uh, it, was, it was about the feeling of the piece. Mm. So yeah, so everything I make for them is quite abstract, but there should be a feeling of that piece or that um, written chapter in the image to draw people in. So yeah, Perfect. so they made posters of these and this is one of those posters. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. That's and this is another one as well. This is uh, data and politics. Um, and um, it was one of the chapters. And I mean, like, I just like it. It's really vibrant. And it, yeah. it just shows the use of like, very simple mark making, um, which I'm really particularly stuck on uh, making marks, just adding particular marks to my work. Um, and I really like, I really like putting a lot of energy into the work as well. So yeah, yeah this right. is this is one of those pieces. Now this that. this is coming now to to um, your your winning your award winning um, piece of work. Yeah, uh, I was just fascinated because 
uh, the fact that you wrote this down. And I, I think it's worthy of going through almost every single quote that you've done there. <laughs> so I leave that. Yeah. So this, uh, hmm. so the piece um, that uh, that won the award um, is it's called it's called Twitter Jail. I call it Twitter Jail because you have to give it a title. Um, and of course, uh, Twitter is 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 heavily in the news at the moment because it seems to be well. It's obviously the platform for Trump to uh, shout about what he wants to shout about. Um, um, but, but they do have a tendency to censor particular groups of people and not censor others. And and there's different sections of, of uh, you know, there's, a, um, there's Twitter, um, MENA, which is Middle East, North Africa, there is Twitter Europe, there is, you know, so, so um, this piece was an investigative piece on why Twitter was censoring particular words um, of, uh, of Arabic language, and then and and accounts were being suspended. And um, for us, I, normal people, I, I think I have it here because I, when I when I'm talking to an art director or, or a writer and they're describing to me, I really like them to. I feel like I'm ranting a lot, but I like them to just talk and rant out and. Uh, and there, there is where the magic comes out. So I let them talk freely and I'll take notes while they're speaking. Um, so we'll have a conversation and um, it's like they're kind of like thinking out loud, but they don't think they're actually really saying very much. Um, but I, I'm catching bits. That, they're they're um, basically giving you a very good brief. Are important. So for you can see there it says this is more serious than average twitter users think and so the average twitter user just shares stuff like you know lovely sunsets you know they might see something that might they might be angry with in the news or however but um twitter does censor particular voices and there were particular words that were being used in the arab language that actually were quite meaningless um but they were from kind of like particularly you know activists or um People who wanted to kind of who were who were uh, against the the regimes or however, so um, it was very particular. And it's important that these voices are heard and not censored and not stopped, because you know there are some people that should be stopped, but there are other people who shouldn't be, and they, it could be the only way that they have conversation. People are reliant on hearing the, these pieces of information. So, yeah. and I um, see here. You, you, yeah. One of your notes is don't use um, the, the Twitter logo. Yeah, so it, every every article about Twitter always has the Twitter logo and it kind of makes it feel like it's less serious. Yeah. And it's, see, it's, such a, it's a cute logo and it's um, and Andals just didn't want to use it, wanted to come up with something a little different. Oh. So this is what um, you did. This is the start. Yeah. So I did particularly use the blue, which would be identifiable, mm -hmm. but I wanted to use something that was uh, yeah, maybe more like aggressive, realistic, or however. Um, I mean, this is not really quite aggressive. You would think that this is kind of beautiful, and then you add the splash of red, and then you see it's quite aggressive. So the cage is just, I mean, he was very particular that he wants the cage because the cage is controlling. Yeah. It controls the, the tweets that are going out. Um, and um, so these are all the tweets in the cage and one has broken free, one has gotten away, but it's pretty quickly shot down and that is that the, the account is suspended. Um, and I had kind of like almost finished that image without the black marks on it, because this is where my mark making comes in. It's quite, I feel quite important. It felt unfinished to me without having these, when these black marks were absent, um, I was like, it needs something else, there's something that's missing there. Um, and the black marks, they're not necessarily very aggressive, but when you point it towards the back of the bird and the spray of red is out there, then you imagine yourself what this black mark actually means. But they were, they were a very important piece to put in there on that final image um, to, to uh, to make it look finished. Um, and so this piece was um, chosen, selected as the winning piece for the investigative journalism for the V&A Museum Awards. And um, they, the judges 
uh, decide that it was just so innovative, which feels really flattering to me because um, it was not, uh, it, it didn't come to me that this would be an innovative piece. It was to tell a story and it was to tell a story clearly. And I feel really pleased because that story now has gotten out there. And um, I mean, like on the day of the announcements of the awards, it was in 147 pieces of media it's still being shared. And um, so it's an important voice to, to be out there. Yeah. Well, well so, done. And that's absolutely superb. And it's a yeah. very memorable image as well. Yes, yes. And people, you know, it's, it, it, the title on it as well is quite, it's quite good. Um, it's it's kind of strange because I it was not a deep thought for me to put a title on it, but I I get this. Yeah. Twitter jail is so amazing, and it's it's so short, and yeah, it's good, and I feel very pleased that I've managed to at least make some sort of impact and make some noise for these issues that happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, at this stage, we try and keep it within the hour, but I mean, you've been so fascinating. You know, oh, really? Because I feel like I've rambled way too much. <laughs> I'm so go, sorry. Go. But no, 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 Anne, I know I mean that. Uh, you know, it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for that. At this point, we ask if people would like to an ask any questions, because that's the point of being live as well. So if anyone has any questions, um, preferably non political, but go on. <laughs> yes, Olivier. <laughs> Hi, and can you hear me? Um, yeah. it's, uh, it was fascinating listening to you and um, I was admiring the, this award-winning um, drawing during the week and I was wondering, and that was right, really fascinating for me what I've just heard, because the one thing that struck me, I studied Arabic in college and I've always been interested in calligraphy as well as a practice. And I was wondering if in that drawing, this was on your mind as well. And the shape of the birds, that to me straight away, you know, uh, that's what it meant to me. And I was wondering if that was on your mind as well uh, when you were creating it. No, I mean, th this is something as well. I do a lot of Islamic writing and mm. actually the Islamic writing that I make can look quite close to Arabic, but it's, um, I have no understanding of Arabic writing. Usually, if I'm making and working with ink, it's very flowy. So I suppose it can be quite calligraphic, but it's like, it, it just so happens that that's how the brush works. That's how mm. the ink flows. And so usually a lot of the ink work that I make, you can see that they're very swooping, brush mark look. Mm. And yeah, so it wasn't on my mind. No, not at all. But I'm flattered that it mm. works that way also. It's good. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I've done. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you very Julie. much. Thank Before you. I got to go to any others, there's a few people that have um, put comments in the chat box or questions. Uh, so Yvonne says, congratulations on your great award. Thank um, you. Ina, iPhone. I'm not sure. Is that Tom? I'm not sure. Oh my God, love the, those treasures. Uh, Nicola asks, do you tint the water so you can see it when you paint with the water first? No, I don't. Um, I mean, like, I'm very lucky. I do have a very light studio. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I contort myself, basically. I get right down. I can see where the water has arrived or however. But, okay. um, I mean, I'm kind of practiced at it now. I've been working in this style, you know, for at least three years, maybe more. Um, so I'm kind of used to knowing where I put the water down. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it is. It's just the kind of like the happy accident. Yes. Um, you know, the, the mark comes out. If, if, if I have a nice drawing or if I have more or less a really, really nice shape, I must show you actually, I do have the bird here. Um, but if I have a really nice shape, I, I like to, somehow I, I, my, I will take it into, um, into Photoshop and I might trim off pieces. Um, but for the most part, there, there is the bird. Um, so that basically is just one piece that came out in one piece and you can see the edges are really quite clean on that. Um, that was like, yeah, trial and error that came probably about the fifth or sixth time. So I, I usually have to, um, and this is the other one where you can see here in these small Twitter birds, there, there is a little bit of overflow there. So I did trim that, those ones out. Um, so you can, you can see how it works. Here's my sketches, my notes, of course, all of these 
these were going to go on display. They were about to head over to the v &A Museum and um, be on display in the museum. Um, but they don't go there now, but the image itself will be on display. Um, yeah. the, the display was due to be canceled because of the pandemic, but the director, Tristan Hunt of the v &A Museum contacted me last week and said the image was so important that it should be on pub public display. So it will, it will go out. So Wonderful. it's good. I'm very Wonderful. pleased about that. And if I have to get there to London by foot, I will go there what? to experience that because <laughs> that sure will be will. Career high for sure. I'm yeah. sure you will. Um, Orla says, love this, really beautiful. Uh, Joy Lambert says, sorry, what's the name of the award? It's the Victorian Albert Museum. Um, I got the, the Illustrated Journalism Award for the individual category and this Moira Gemmel Illustrator of the Year was the, I, I get the shivers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so Sir Quentin Blake won the award, the guy who illustrated all of Roald Dahl's books. Um, Nora Krug won it last year. And yeah, so it's been, it's a quite a, it's good. quite a prestigious award. It's good. Good, good company. Good company. Yes, good company. Um, yeah. Just working backwards to a question, but some comments. Nicholas says, it's great to see your process. Thank you. Anya, Thank brilliant you. images. Uh, Nicholas says, really fascinating. So Nicholas really loves this. And Dennis, my bro says, brilliant, Anne. Do you have a daily work schedule? Is it strictly adhered to or flexible? Um, I'd like to be routined. Um, so, you know, I, I try to get here for 10 o'clock in the morning. I mean, it depends on, what, like, sometimes I might be working to LA time. So I could be working kind of, you know, from seven till kind of like three, four in the morning. It depends on if the, what the deadline is. Um, but Usually I get up, I always have breakfast and I will get on my bike and I will be here usually by 10 o'clock in the morning time. And I like to work and I, you know, I, I, I would work here for eight, 10 hours. Um, I will make something every day. And, um, and, and even so, there is nothing that is wrong in drawing. I like, I, I have to, and I think I emphasize that to you as well. Alan at the very start and the same with the group of people who were in that little art mine there is nothing wrong when you draw you like when people say oh I draw so badly I'm this is so bad yeah. I mean like my goal is to draw badly now these days mm -hmm. I I bad drawing is <clears throat> is the thing yes, yes. <laughs> naive I call it naive drawing so maybe that it make if it's in your mind that you can't draw that is now what people want to see is naive drawing. So don't try too hard, be relaxed about it. And um, there is nothing wrong in how you draw and nobody is a bad drawer ever. They just can't draw the way they would like to copy somebody else's, but that's not you. So, you know, forget it. I remember the, uh, Andre Previn um, talking to uh, Morkman Wise and he was playing the piano. Andre Previn was a, was a conductor and, and brilliant pianist. And there's yeah. a lovely sketch where he's playing all the wrong stuff. You see, and it's, it's, it's absolute rubbish. So Andre Previn says, excuse me, excuse me. He says, what you're playing is absolutely rubbish. It's, it's all wrong. And your, your man stands up, grabs him by the throat and says, no, he said, I am playing the correct notes, but not necessarily in the correct order. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just think what it, there's no, it doesn't matter, you know, how you draw, it, 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 it should just feel satisfying for you. And yeah. um, I mean, I draw the most crazy stuff now. And I just like, some days I'll just sit there and let my hand just go away with it and see what happens. So, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, just a few, few more. Owen says, great interview, thanks. Hugh Cummins says, very inspiring interview, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hugh, that's great. Um, and I think that's about it. Anybody else got a question they want to get in before we, we wrap up? Don't be shy. Somebody's got to have a question. If anybody has anything they want to ask, you know, afterwards, they can drop me a line on my website or through my email or on Instagram. I'm happy to answer. And yeah. yeah. And, and, and kiernan.com, easy to remember. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if there aren't any more, Oh, sorry, this is just a new message here. Maybe it is a question. Thanks so much. So interesting from Autumn. Um, thank you. Thanks, Autumn. <laughs> um, okay, guys, look, thank you so much. Anne, 
you're an absolute inspiration. I mean, talk about the art as well and, you know, drawing inspiration from the well. This is just class. Um, I'm delighted that you did this. Uh, and thank you so much for your time and your energy. Uh, is, thank is you, Alan. Infectious. And I, I feel so proud, Alan. I have to say, I feel like you're my, like, my drawing baby. <laughs> Well, <laughs> when I see your work and I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you, I always give you credit for, for drawing that out of me. And I, I, for that, I'm eternally grateful. And I never, I've made a career out of it. So, yes. Happy yeah. days. Happy days. Yeah. 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 So, look, a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. And thank yeah. you all for spending the time on your Saturday mornings, your precious time with the lovely weather out there. Uh, yeah. For coming to see us and talk to us. Really appreciate it. So we shall leave it there. And thank you, Anne. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Bye Goodbye. From thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Bye. You, thank Everybody you, thank have you. a lovely Saturday. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.